respond to it. So let me in brief try to, let me, let me try to tell you my response to a book that you know nothing about, which also informs this work. My idea, which will gather no agreement here, because it doesn't gather a lot of agreement, agreement anywhere, is that there is a kind of architecture which I myself have continued to engage in, um, which is architecture that is in the central tradition of architecture. That is, it produces objects as products, whatever, in whatever fashion, that are within the central tradition of solving a problem or of synthesizing disparate conditions. Uh, it, one could call it construction, because there is something constructive both about the traditions, the antecedents, etc., about construction, to actually do something in work. The problem with that attitude is it disregards, in my view, what are the proper dislocative tendencies of the day, which I believe do exist. I mean, in a post-Holocaust time, etc. Whatever the dislocational tendencies are, to simply avoid them, not to find a way to express them, is a dissimulative attitude, which I think no longer, in a certain way for me, has a place in architecture. The opposite side of that coin is to reflect merely the dislocative tendencies of the time, to use the phrase or to misuse it, uh, deconstruction. Uh, to engage in work that is reflective of those dislocative tendencies while appropriate as reflexive and reflective of our time suffers from the absence of another issue, although it also brings one up, um, which is an ethical value. Um, the same Ann Berggren sat at a conference that I moderated last I guess October, um, on deconstruction in architecture where people like Eisenman, Frank Gehry, um, theologians, uh, the Christian one from Williams, who's a very famous American deconstructivist, Mark Taylor, the Jewish one from uh, the University of Maryland, Susan Handelman, etc., etc. John Whiteman, formerly of Harvard, now the SOM director. Uh, Mark Wigley, who's writing the piece in the forthcoming show at The Modern on this subject. Um, and it was very interesting because during the course of that conference, Mark Taylor at one point, who has been very interested in what I will call nomination, the naming of things, if one thinks of it biblically. Um, and at that conference, he twisted that, of course, and became interested in denomination, that is, the taking away of a name. And it was very interesting because then Susan Handelman challenged him and talked about that she simply didn't have that luxury because as a Jew, she had to superimpose an ethical consideration. What's interesting about deconstruction is that it is at once ethical in that it does reflect the condition of the day. Its problem is that it, what is absent in it is the desire to rewrite. And you can spell that W-R-I-T-E or R-I-G-H-T, whichever way you like, to rewrite a condition knowing that it can never be what it was originally. You can never put Humpty Dumpty back together again as you remember him. But if you don't try, then the central overriding condition within the tradition of architecture to make it right by rewriting, I think is lost. However, if in the process of rewriting it, you dispense with or dismiss the genuinely, authentically dislocative elements of the day, you are only engaging in a dissimulative attitude or at most a kind of something that I would call plastic surgery, the pretension that the scar, the original wound never existed. So these ideas, or this idea, this tripartite attitude of mine is now finding its way into this work. So having said that, these are the ideas that have structured what in this first section of slides, frankly, is ambiguous. I'll explain it, explain it in as least gratuitous way I, as I can, 
but they're, because it's not as yet programmatic in the work. So if I could have the lights, please. If you don't mind turning the switch right there. I guess it's even more than that. Jesus. I'm going to start with this project, which is a... Um, which is the first of these series of initial projects where there was a kind of an ambiguity. And it really wasn't as conscious as I'm going to explain it, but hindsight gives you the luxury, gives one the luxury of looking back and saying, oh yes, and I thought such and such. Um, this is a project that my wife and I, my wife is an architect, her name is Margaret McCurry, we're partners in our practice in Chicago. This is our weekend house. Um, what interested both of us at that time was the question of language. Uh, perhaps it's better to, well, it can also be shown here. Um, by language, I mean the doubling up of an American language, which I would submit has always been hybridized, uh, the language of rural America, um, that is the barn and the granary, which obviously is a sort of an American descendant of uh, Christ, I'm going to get seasick looking at this, huh? Um, of the European more ecclesiastical tradition. America has always produced a kind of hybridized architecture, a hybrid being a cross-fertilization with intention to make one better than the earlier one. But in that process of making it better is the belief in the earlier product. So the belief in the original language, which is ecclesiastical, obviously a basilica and a baptistry, informs a lot of American rural architecture. Most of the work you're gonna see, incidentally, is, is of the land. I don't have, I have never really had a lot of large-scale work. I don't seek it. I'm not so interested in the city, per se, to seek a kind of work that I find, in a way, Problematic. I think um, searching for an American architecture, one tends more normally to look to the land. So much of this work is informed by that. So in any case, the ambiguity between the two languages was crucial to the development, to the, to the design of that house that Margaret and I engaged in. Because we were well aware of using, by using these found objects, of the doubling up of those languages. That project, in turn, led to, that's a broken slide, I'm, I knew it, the glass had broken, but, um, but so forgive me, um, led to another project, to a series of projects actually, again, not programmatic in their inclination, uh, again looking to the rural, hybridized, secondary, not primary, notions of form, of idea. Um, this is a project in upstate New York in Dutchess County is a sort of horse farm um, where we were asked to do a um, stable, these are early sketches, a sort of coach house, stable, uh, a guest house piece, and that's all under construction now. But again, there is this, this attitude of several things, not just because there's several buildings. Um, the slides on the left will be the guest house, the ones on the right will be the coach house and the barn around this paddock. Um, but that they come from, that they're secondary ideas. They're not initiating ideas. They are of a type that look to, an, to antecedents, to an earlier um, primary set of forms that generally, for the largest part of American architecture that can be called architecture as a conscious mechanism, emanate from Europe. But again, these, these, this project is not what I would consider something that is actualized, is, is trying to programmatically drive the work and to find in the ambiguity of ideas a way in which um, something further can be attempted. This was another project in that same vein, now built, which is a house in Connecticut that is very simply two, um, uh, rectangular parallel pipettes, I mean two gabled buildings um, that come together in a way that is not nearly as important 
as the axial implications of those buildings, the primary and secondary axes of which meet in a space outside the building, the secondary space here, and on and on. So that one thing leads to another where the building becomes only incidental in something in the land. And that, that ambiguity of creating for a text which is in a continuous state of interpretation uh, tends to go against that interpretation. And what I set out to do is to, among other things, talk about the issue of faith, that is, at the coming of Christ, where there is no longer a need for interpretation, that faith overrides interpretation. And so whether it is faith in a theological issue or it's faith in formal issues establishing precedents or hierarchies, um, those tend not to be Hebraic in inclination. I would say there is not, not only Hebraic form, a particular Hebraic form, or form that is Hebraic in intention or initiation, I would say there is none at all. I would say that form, within the context of the second commandment of uh, uh, bowing down to graven images and so forth, uh, that form itself is not the intention of, of a text which is in a con continuous state of interpretation, where, where the reader, uh, humankind, and, uh, and equates him or herself to a divine parody, a position of parody, and within that condition, continue to interact and to interpret and to overturn, to displace. So that's, I mean, that's part of what this book is about. So, but formally, I don't think those are, there is an extension or a correlation. In any case, back to the lights, I guess. Um, so in this continuing ambiguous ambiguity of these kinds of, of buildings, um, while they were not yet programmatic, they continued to suggest to me that something was perhaps driving them that was not rooted in a building as an icon. I mean, buildings that are broken into two, buildings that are cleaved, buildings that are ruptured, buildings that are sheared, and so forth and so on, which has been a large part of my work in any case, regardless of formally what one might be seeing. I mean, uh, the, the fact that there are the two rectangles and so forth drive, drove that work. And so these early projects were about that search. Here's another one, an unbuilt large house in a place called Lake Bluff above Chicago, um, which is a house that is broken for purposes of views, but let's face it, architects rationalize views or function or whatever to get to other subjects that are, that are also troubling them. And by using, by exploiting various views and solving certain problems, um, one also had an opportunity to digress and to divest the work of a kind of presence by simply breaking it apart. Um, now, it's not exactly broken apart in such a ruptured way as to lose sight of the individual pieces, but the idea that it is simply broken into pieces that are not part of a recognized, recognizable whole based on antecedents is in part what drove this kind of work. That's also true in this project. I think there's two more projects that I've put together of this variety where it really wasn't as yet programmatically driven. Uh, this is a house outside of Chicago that is broken into a series of pieces, a little his and hers garage that define a central court, two other pieces that are reflections of them. It's as if this gable has been pulled from this one and this one from that one and a drum and going across a river and into the trees with a, uh, 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 even at that point, not resolving it into one building where there is a hot tub on one side and a screen porch on the other. So that the work, the, the driving force of this kind of work was something that broke it into two. And that, well, broke it into two in the sense of its disruption was based on one's ability to actually go through it and to break through the building uh, itself. The building is a very, I mean, I don't think it's, its point is to sort of go into the plan. Um, 
but the the idea is always to take it apart to to find almost by way of analysis to see what these kinds of things are made of but nonetheless in all these cases it was also done basically symmetrically which is interesting in hindsight I can't say that that was this what I'm about to say is a conscious thing but as the building was was being scrutinized and broken apart ever so slightly like breaking a geo to see from the harsh rocky outside to the smooth inside nonetheless it was symmetrical so that there was still a kind of anthropomorphism or in, in engagement with the body in seeing something broken apart but very tentatively so that it still remains symmetrical and in that there's a kind of anxiety and there always was in that work for me here's where it started to get a little started to shift it's almost a transitional project this is a a, a, a camp for the Boy Scouts, but only for handicapped children, um, in a on a place called the Fox River, about 50 miles west of Chicago, um, and which is now in phase one under construction. And this is just a little vignette of different kinds of things that we early on were working on. Um, but it's a very interesting project because it it just programmatically it overturns the preconception of that paramilitary group, the Boy Scouts of America, who have always modeled themselves almost after Norman Rockwell's painting, the image of the able-bodied scout, the able-bodied boy. And for them to merely accept the notion of doing it for handicapped children alone, I found extremely interesting. And it represents the full gamut of handicap. I guess we got it because we had done the Library for the Blind that Eric Moss alluded to. Um, and so it, it, it also means physical handicaps such as blindness, Down syndrome, uh, uh, blindness, paraplegia, etc. Um, but also emotional handicap like Down syndrome, various forms of retardation, epilepsy, and so forth. So it's a very interesting project. And in the way that we had done the Library for the Blind, we wanted to produce an authentic camping experience that would override that thing in the convention of what architects do, i.e. barrier-free architecture. They think they solve problems by making buildings that simply you know, solve the apparent functional dysfunctionality of a user when what they ought to be doing is doing that, of course, but then ennobling the condition and bringing a certain amount of joy. So I really want to do an authentic camp. I mean, I think that a blind kid has the same right that I did when I was in the Boy Scouts, namely to fall down in the forest at night and skin your knee. I mean, it's okay. So that's, I mean, at one level, that's what this was about. But at another level, it also, because one could then deal with the fractiousness of work, understanding that the users themselves were not whole. And the idea not to do that to mock the user, but to always try to reassemble it in nature. So that, like, this was an early sketch of mine, um, I guess done in 86, of a, of a, of a um, oh, an activity center where there would be, you know, the place that the boys sit around and sing, tell ghost stories, whatever, and that, it that the columns would be completed. I mean, it's not a very deep idea, by trees in nature. So the intention of trying to get it right, I guess, in a way, maybe began there, but it wasn't conscious. I mean, I did it, as architects do, of taking a form that is partially architectural, the stuff made out of dead materials, and using the live materials, the trees, to complete the form. So it's not exactly a brilliant, lucid idea. So these are some of the building types. Here are the half buildings, this activity thing with the fireplace of singing songs, and then having all the troops gather together in a much larger arena as a sort of jamboree or what they call campery or something like that. Um, so that project began to say some things to me 
that were sort of interesting. And of course, this one, which I think, I think is the last one of this series, um, sort of did the same thing. This is a project in, in Berlin for their international Bauausstellung, the, the so-called IBA, IBA, um, that is just now being completed. And this is a part of the Tegel project near the airport that Charles Moore worked on, where a series of architects did individual little urban villas, John Haydock, uh, Paulo Portuguese, Antoine Grumbach, Bob Stern, myself, Moore, etc. We were all given the same program, which is, and they're all little six flats. And it's a 16 meter by 16 meter by so high, uh, same roof pitch, etc. And what I wanted to do was to take it, was to give it and to take it away. That is to say, to produce a building that is that appeared to be contextual. Um, but in the end, I have no particular use for contextualism because it is simply a part of that polite tradition of architecture that, that legitimates what came before and in the process infers a disillusionment about one's own time. So the idea, I, what, what I did was to take Mies van der Rohe's 1909 uh, First Pearls House which is still alive and well as a health clinic in Berlin, and to use it as a model and to do a tripartite building with a base in the middle of the top, three bays, but the columns were downspouts, not columns, but that's not important. And to make a building that appeared to be conventional and then to take the building and to crack it into two. And in that cracking procedure to measure the building with a dimension which will come up again and again, which is the cubit, that is the half meter, which is from the elbow to the outstretched fingers, that's the ordinary cubit, at least described in the Bible. And to do that measurement in a way as a scaffold. Now a scaffold to me has always been a fabulous building. I mean, I remember when I first came here, which I see vestiges of, what, what was really fabulous was the students had made, and I guess then condoed, who knows, their little drafting stations in which I think the building part, department probably forced you to take down. But in any case, it was fabulous because it was a building within a building. Um, and it, this, you know, a scaffold is a fabulous building, which is the hidden building. It's the building that you build in order to build the building that you leave. And when the building that you leave then has outlived its usefulness, you once again build this building in order to take down the building you had built. And so, to use the jargon of the day, the trace of that hidden building, the scaffold, the ambiguity that a scaffold implies about not knowing whether the building is coming up or going down, frankly, was a part of what was on my head. So that this grid, which of course is the color of the German flag, the red portion of the yellow stuck was the yellow portion of the German flag, um, was done as a scaffold that produced a winter garden, I mean, in terms of use, but also was allowed to run through and become the mullions of, that, of the windows. So, as, so that the building, which on the one hand appears to be contextually driven, that is that East European, Middle European rather, Berliner model, in the same time is as a scaffold. And also the building has been cleaved. I find the problem with the building now, for me looking back at it, is not putting it, not trying to put it back together again. I find that problematic. I mean, there's another way of reading this which is really disruptive of, 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 of killing architecture, of cleaving through traditions and breaking them simply to display the dislocative tendencies of the time. The building on the side, of course, is very conventional in order to get it across. The building has been, I don't have any photographs, the building is now finished entirely. Which is interesting because I was there, I don't know, maybe three, four weeks ago. And the building, I, I wish I, I have to make slides of it. I have some photographs taken by John Zukowski, the director of architecture at the Art Institute, um, which show the building when we last saw it, which is complete, but the scaffolding is up. In other words, this building too, had a real scaffolding on this sort of, on, well, you can't see, on the, on the other scaffolding, which I'm leaving behind. It was very interesting 
to see it in that way. So here's the back of the building. That's the most interesting part of the building, is the part that the, this, this matrix, this, this scaffold, this cubit uh, defined grid runs through this winter garden, which is in turn cleaved by the person, if for no other reason, to get to their units. I mean, there's three units on this side, three units on the other side. Obviously, this project was also very important for me to, you know, to begin to disrupt stuff, but still didn't get it right. Okay, then the project that probably did more than anything to sort of move me into another direction uh, was uh, a synagogue which didn't get built that I was commissioned to design, which is sort of an incredible story. Um, but in any case, I was commissioned to do this project in, let's see, I've been working on this book four years, so three years ago. The book had begun, and it was wonderful to then act for the first time to get a synagogue. And I, because I'd been working on the book, there's no way I would have been sufficiently informed to have done this if I hadn't been. I tried to engage both readings, both traditions of Judaism, that, that is the, the, the part that it, which is cleaved by Christ that preceded that time. Things that preceded 2,000 years ago, i.e., working backwards, the temples of Herod, the vision of Ezekiel, Solomon's temple, and the tent uh, described in Exodus. Uh, and then the part that is after that time, which is the distancing of Jews from any further interpretation of the text. And like Muslims who orient themselves toward Mecca during a sacred holiday like Eid, uh, synagogues are oriented back toward Jerusalem. And the distance from that original and the nostalgia, the exilic operation, the overwhelming desire to return is what Im imbues it, it, the, the time after Christ in terms of synagogues. So what I wanted to do was to superimpose both. So what you have here is um, the east elevation of one of the reconstructions of Solomon's temple and a transverse section. And these three plans on the bottom are different reconstructions of Solomon's temple. At the top, here and here, is plan and elevation of the Temple of Amun Ra at Karnak. Obviously, um, uh, obviously, one can see the, the relation between obelisk and column a a a semiotically as signing or signifying a sacred place of, dis of, of acting as a threshold. Um, and one could, obviously there have been um, many contributions to archaeology inferring that the Jews in, at the time of Exodus and leaving Egypt culturally brought certain baggage with them, which also perhaps meant the relationship between the Egyptian temple and the Temple of Solomon. Now in any case, both of those temples were oriented toward the east because of, of the sun cult uh, of the of, uh, interest, fascinations of the day. It's also true of the Essenes, or Essenes, however you pronounce, the pre-Christian cult based on the Dead Sea Scrolls that were uh, discovered some years ago. So the temple was always informed, among other things, by orientation. The synagogue, which is informed by orientation as well, is an orientation that distances itself from the original and stipulates itself as a copy. That is to say, there is a certain mi mi mimetic operation in a synagogue which is removed from the original and honors the original by orienting toward it. These are exterior and interior photographs taken from uh, Carol Krinsky's book on Eastern uh, European synagogues. So there are, those are the two traditions. So this congregation um, uh, offered to buy this log cabin in an area northwest of Chicago. 
and they asked me, as their architect, to, what did I think about it? I thought it was fabulous, because, why? Two reasons, one, it was, it had the same uh, Scandinavian stave church primal quality of synagogues, which after all worship was conducted in houses originally, and also because it was oriented toward Jerusalem. So, I mean, the inside was fabulous because this sort of log lodge, big cubic space, um, fully chinked and so forth, I thought it was fabulous. So what, what I did was to superimpose, this is that log cabin, this piece, and the orientation to Jerusalem as it's sited is this way, which happens to be in Chicago in an area of around east, east, southeast. Um, it's about 12 degrees. So I superimposed upon that, that became the sacred space, at the secular space of the synagogue by producing at a one-to-one -one measurement scale the first story of the Temple of Sol Solomon with the two columns cleaved, that is removed, the, their capitals removed and cleaved, showing their emptiness, remembering the pro Herod's problem by placing the Roman eagle uh, on the tympanum over the, the last temple as an accommodation to Rome and the priests in turn removing the sacred text, the Torah. Then the juxtaposition of those two, almost as an entrapment of the two, of the two Judaisms, of the two, um, of, of a religion cleaved historically and um, intrinsically as its text is no longer exegetic in inclination, is the double uh, apparatus that I was trying to do. I only did the first story of the temple with the with a, a trellis or scaffolding in cubit dimensions for the Jewish holiday sukkahs, but also as a scaffold implying, inferring that the temple might then be completed, surrounding the synagogue. So this is the plan. This is the this slide is upside down, but in any case, this is the orientation. What's interesting is the orientation that the one particular column posits a blockage on the entrance to the synagogue. That is one of the columns um, of the temple, which you can see on the right. That project then began to really drive um, a way uh, that my work hadn't, frankly, taken before that. Um, and at that time, another project that did the same thing was a project that still is up. In, it's in one of the niches in the German Architecture Museum um, in Frankfurt, where um, a number of architects were asked to do permanent exhibitions on the theme of, perhaps Joseph Rickward's theme, a man's original house. Um, and what I did, I picked a particular niche that had two very large trees in it and after a lot of false starts decided to simply measure the space that that was stripping everything else away that architecture finally for me is an act of speculation and that measurement as spe as, as the single speculating device when all the metaphors and all of the uses of architecture are removed gives one a chance to engage in simply to measure it. Almost as you interpret a text, you measure it, and you see the implications of that measurement. So I did a three-dimensional grid, again based on the cubit, again oriented toward Jerusalem, that appeared to entrap the two trees, but in turn d d disintegrated, um, inferring that perhaps nature prevails ultimately. So the, and then where the grid was broken, it was red. Um, and that is still up there. Um, this, um, it's very hard to photograph because it takes up the entire space. Um, but in any case, the project was a very interesting one for me. But again, these projects don't, how should I say, don't get to the point that I made originally, um, which the last couple projects will, several projects of trying to rewrite it, knowing it can never be the same way again, of, of, of superimposing a condition which is, I think, endemic 
to architects of trying to get it right, of simply not exploding it. Um, this is a project, not nearly as serious as the others, but obviously in that same time frame, as a itsy bitsy little project that's 20 by 26 in the Merchandise Mart in Chicago, and it was a showroom for Formica. And all we did was to take the grid of the city, which is only disrupted generally in Chicago either by plank roads that lead to places like Milwaukee or by natural forms like the river, the Chicago River, which in turn produce interesting um, trapezoidal results in buildings. So this is the Merchandise Mart. mark. You superimpose the double grid. You take it down to the scale of a little showroom. Um, you do the grid as a three-dimensional matrix in black in the form, of, once again, as a qubit. Um, and uh, drive a diagonal in white through it and cleave your way through the damn thing and where you actually break through it host all the little samples of the product. And what was interesting about the project was to suggest that Formica had, that everything has worth intrinsically, that it is not just seen as metaphor. I mean, most of us, certainly I, suffer from thinking that materials like formica are only as they're used, that is, as countertops or panels or whatever the hell they're used for, never thinking that the that products like that have intrinsic worth. So this was an attempt to get rid of metaphor and to simply and to infer that the product, that the, what you were doing, had worth of itself. So by just producing that doubled grid, that was my bumbling way of addressing that problem. This is the, just a drawing of superimposing those grids, and then when one breaks through them, what it is that one gets. And then where the object of desire, the little samples are. So the project was built, and is a maze, finally. Um, but where it is, it doesn't infer its use. Uh, it is simply there. And it's perhaps the first time that I know that just that product has been done that way. I, the, the year before this, every couple, three years, Formica gets it redone by someone else. And the person prior to me was my good friend Tom Beebe, now the dean at Yale, who had done a portion, a fragment of a Greek stoa. And it's, it struck me that this would be a good time to try to suggest that the product had usefulness of itself, not that it was seen from the distance uh, of nostalgically looking back to the use of something, but rather what something really is. This is a much later project. This is a a house that we're working on now that is, uh, I only have model shots of, but gets much closer to what I'm talking about. Um, the, the house has an armature, which is a hundred foot long space that is at both ends nothing in width and goes up to seven feet. And this is one story higher than this, which is one story higher than this. So in this area, as you see the contours, there are steps. So it's a very dramatic, long space. Off that armature, there are three double cubes that are inferred by a sacred and a profane. That is a form that is the gable form, the church form, the, the, the sort of domestic equivalent of an ecclesiastic precedent. And then this, the profane space, the master bedroom, uh, which has the ceiling inverted, but in all events happens to describe a cube. And so those two cubes with a hinge start out in that condition. And this is one of the iterations. We're trying several. And the, it starts to break open at the, you know, using the hinge that it pulls apart and then breaks open again. And if it were to break open, that is, if this part were to come back to this position, it would be that, except in this, in this direction, and the, where the, the 
valley of the inverted gable and the peak of the conventional gable are aligned, in this case, they would be serially disposed, adjacent to each other. So that the fact is, using the hinge, one could never get it back. Once you begin the operation, of uh, moving it around, it can never go back to the original position. And that gets a little closer as an example, perhaps, of a way of trying to rewrite something that is in the beginning uh, conventionalized in the way that we understand building and from their precedence, but begins, when it cracks open and leaves the mark of its original being on the original form, as you see more clearly here, it can never go back to that thing. It continues to open up, and we now will do some fragments in the landscape to carry it yet further, to infer a continuous opening of that, but in a, but in a way trying to, re, to put it back together again, but of course it can't in that particular way. So that's another example. This is perhaps a little more clear. Um, we're doing an energy museum in a place called, of all places, called Zion, which is halfway between Chicago and Milwaukee. Exactly, it's exactly on the border, which is exactly 45 miles away from each. And Zion is a very, very, very interesting place. Zion, the town, was designed and built. This is its 1902 plat, and this is an early aerial perspective commissioned by the man that designed the town, an evangelical minister named Reverend Dowie, who designed the town with an immense park in the center called Shiloh Park. I mean, much of Central and Middle America is um, uh, apocalyptically driven by its fundamentalist views. And of course, it was in the air at the turn of the century. So this old town was gridded with immense 100-meter uh, wide, 600, 300 feet wide boulevards with median strips going through, cleaving through the town um, in, in uh, um, north, south, east, west with diagonals all leading to a um, tabernacle in this immense park on Lake Michigan. And it was built largely. So if you were to stand in the middle of Shiloh Park, and if you were to draw a line from Shiloh Park to Jerusalem, it would be this direction. And if you were to take the two columns of the Temple of Solomon and put them there, what you would have would be the two nuclear reactors of Zion's nuclear power plant with its, uh, its building is just there. So we were asked to do an energy museum somewhere in this region. We elected to rewrite it, to put it back on the east axis coming from the center of Zion, Shiloh Park, oriented due east, and to do a building that would act out this issue of attempting to heal an irreparable wound. It cannot be healed, but the attempt represents the intrinsic optimism that separates architects in a way from readers conventionally, but it gives and endows them, or as a self-endowment, with an attitude of trying to rewrite something, knowing that they will fail, know knowing that nostalgia is uh, 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 not resolvable, knowing that exile is, is perpetual, and knowing that death can't be overcome. Nonetheless, the attempt to do that is humankind's, and I would submit architecture's way of operating. So this building is a building in three parts. It's a building 
but these are just photographs of the site. If you, if you just concentrate on the, on the ground floor plan, um, entering from the west and the corresponding uh, a, a, a section and side elevation. Entering from the west, the first portion of the, well, the building is cleaved, is marked at these points which align with the nuclear power plant. And it, that, that is the building programmatically which is the museum, beginning with the quest for fire, uh, etc., and ending up with robotics and all of the stuff of energy museums. Um, but the first part of the building is a, what I'm trying to do as a conventional building in detail. That is to say, its trusses, which are steel tubes, do not express moment. There are no gussets. Moment and bending are taken through the welds. So it simply is, I mean, it's what we're working on in, in working drawings, but let me try and explain it with my hands. It's an old cultural tradition. Um, where the tubes are simply welded and the weld in a mute way takes, makes the building inexpressive. It's a, it's a conscious attempt now to make a building in its, in the normal way, in the conventional way buildings are constructed. I'll put quotes around it. So, for example, the, the moment isn't expressed, there is no expression of ducts, there is no expression of energy in the building. The, the, uh, there is no, the, the lighting is concealed, it's not expressed, uh, etc. The, the exterior steel panel system is on girts uh, and is a flush panel system. The concrete below is flush, it's rubbed. Uh, there are no expression of ties. It is a conventional building. At this point of disruption, first of all, the trees up to that point are conifers. At that point, they become red maples, so in the autumn they die. Um, and the walls become corrugated metal uh, as a, um, uh, a a panel system, as a sandwich panel, which is much thinner, thereby allowing the conduits on the inside to all of a sudden appear, thereby allowing the ducts to suddenly appear, um, etc. So the bill and, 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 the, and, the, and the trusses now have very expressive um, gussets and instead of tubes are double angles so the gusset fits in between but as an expressive gusset is not a slick thing, it's a certain crudity engaged. Finally at the end the building attempts to rewrite itself, to put itself back together and doesn't. That is the, the, uh, on, the on the inside um, the uh, walls begin to appear and the ducts are beginning to be hidden using punka devices. It's yet a third way. Gussets are still there with double angles, but now they're a very slick circular gusset, um, etc. So the building is trying to put itself back together. And finally at the very end is the theater where they promise they're only going to show movies in the morning and when, when the movies or whatever, whatever the things are about energy are done, the screen goes up and the, whatever is pulled back and the sun uh, due east and the lake and the horizon is there. So that's a way of trying to uh, express the inability to get it right to show the disjunctive, um, but still trying to do it. These are sections that don't show real well, cut through to the east and then the sun, and then the model. The site is a mile long and there are trees and canals that go back to the center of Zion, as if it was the center of the world, as if it were Eden, as if it were paradise, and as they move toward the building and then where that building is transgressed by its relationship to the reactor. These are photographs of the entrance of the, to the building and up the ramp and under roof and buses would let school children off and so forth and these go over the canals at that point and the trees which run through and then you'll see the slightly different color as they are at that point.
finally, this last project is, since I've been spending a lot of time in Berlin, there uh, is an exhibition at the Staatsgallery, the State Museum in Berlin, uh, in West Berlin. And it simply is called 2000. And it's an exhibition about uh, the condition of, what does one see about the condition of Berlin? Of course, this is the same thing of trying to get it right and failing. Um, I see Berlin, I mean, Berlin is an incredible city because it's a city that's been cleaved into two. And it's a city that in that cleaving process has actually, out of anxiety, created a very powerful city. It is the art scene, perhaps in the world now. Um, it's a wonderful city and because of this disruptive condition and the attempt to, to deal with it, which is on everyone's mind in Berlin, in both Berlins, at all times. So my idea is to take the Berlin Wall, I mean the orientation, this is to the north, so East Berlin is in fact in the east, is what. But to break the wall at a series of points, which you, you would go across, you would have to climb and go across in this way, um, with a steel, and this is a wrong drawing because it's the steel plate comes up and goes over so that once you enter into that it's as if you have blinders you can't see laterally you can just go across the wall produce a canal on both sides open the wall underneath at certain points um, do sycamore trees and clay gravel as are in the Tuileries Gardens and produce a linear park in effect thinking once again that this is the an another uh, uh, are these the two trees of Eden and so forth and how the waters irrigate the world once again and how they, they, they become the forests of the south and the north and so forth uh, and the, you know, the implications of the east and orientation and of the west uh, and orientation obviously the eastern orientation uh, in the temple is one that you come in uh, with God in anticipation of a messianic age, where Western orientation, um, up until the time of the Renaissance, you'll find that all of these Cistercian monasteries, Gothic cathedrals, and so forth, are entered to the West because reunification with God the Father through the body and blood of Christ only occurs after death, and one then goes back to return to live out life in the West. So these were some of the ideas. This is a, a photograph of, of a model that we built. This is a drawing of um, a large section of the wall at the point of the Brandenburg Gate um, coming around and a detail of it and an elevation of the Brandenburg Gate where we would also position the two columns, Joachim and Boaz from 1 Kings 5, in a project that we now call Der Berliner Mauer, which means the Berlin Wall and Erichtung, Erichtung uh, in 1961 when it was erected. And the German word Verstellung, which is a very interesting word, which really means dissimulation, in the year 2000, of, uh, of feigning to do something. So this is the condition of, of passage, where you would go across, and you'd, you'd, you'd rise up between these two steel plates on open riser um, steel tread, grates to go across the wall and the wall there would be benches that you could not quite see across you'd have to lean down to see across the, but it would unite the canal um, if nothing else and produce the two parks the wall is a fabulous wall for those of you that haven't seen it in that it's it you know on the and the west side it is nothing but graffiti and, the, and there's been so much graffiti that it has a sort of patina of, of all colors. And on the east side, it is absolutely white. So this is looking at the end of that condition where the figure sitting on these funerary benches that would have the same um, marking engraved into the stone of the project and this is a section cut through uh, in the same way.
Thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer questions if, yes. if you want. Yes. Hmm. Quite possibly, because I think the oh, it's not fine. I mean, I you know, in the end, you if even a Philip Johnson Johnson can say you cannot not know history, you certainly cannot not remember who you are and what you have done as you move ahead. And while this may or may not be an attempt to find a zeitgeist, it certainly is an attempt to express a belief about ethical considerations, about the reflections, the honest reflections of the day, an attempt to rewrite, take it any way you like, um, architecture. Uh, to, that life is, I mean, I, for a long time I've felt that you know, an architect in any case is a double kind of figure where he or she is, is, I have always thought, obligated to reflect their time, but equally obligated to find, to attempt to find an answer to that time. Not that one plays more importantly than the other. These are still based on a very ancient tradition of dialectical thought, but to be obligated to do both. And so the, but then when you realize, I mean, I, the best way I can make an analogy, in, uh, in the Kabbalah, if you read uh, Harold Bloom, for example, um, he, the uh, Yale critic, he writes a number of books. One is called Kabbalah and Criticism. And in the Kabbalah, uh, in this uh, 17th century, there was a man named Simon Luria, and for Harold Bloom, his interpretation of a Lurianic version of the Kabbalah goes like this. That the first part, and you can make the immediate analogy to this tripartite thing, which is what my new writings are about, even before this book is finished. Um, his first, the first part of the Lurianic version of the Kabbalah is called Zimzum in Hebrew, which means the withdrawal of the Creator, allowing humankind to fill that void. In other words, to uh, you can take it as to be constructive. In other words, to to put to be put into the position as a replacement, if you like. Okay, um, in a mimetic position, always with an originally divine creature of your own making in order to, to uh, be constructively engaged. The second part of that Bloom version of the Kabbalah, or interpretation of the Lurianic version, is called Shvirat HaKelim, which means an apocalyptic vision of creation, or the breaking of the vessels. You can take that, if you like, in terms of deconstruction. That is to say, to see creation in an apocalyptically driven way. The third part of uh, without an interest to rewrite it, but to reflect it. The third part is called Tikkun, the name, unfortunately, of not a very good journal of criticism, um, which, is, which engages in restitution to, to try to get it right, okay? And so, I think architecture is also engaged in these three things. I think if the first one, I mean, sort of like if you take contextualism or the classical language or operating within the traditions and the conventions of architecture, whatever you might perceive them by looking over your shoulder to be, to do that in, and not to, is to demonstrate an inability to come to grips with dislocated tendencies, which I think is absolutely problematic. The second part um, is to dwell on those dislocative tendencies and to express them. Um, which has an intrinsic honesty of expressing something that architecture has tended not to express. You can call it the work in the margins. You can call it uh, 
the disjunctive side of architecture, but architects have systematically, in the continuation of their conventions, overridden such things. Uh, it's one of the things that always fascinated me about this place, this school, which attempted to override, to drive a wedge into the convention of architectural education. It was its optimistic, you know, Im imperative in the beginning. I think still is probably. But the third part of trying, knowing that you're going to fail. I mean, it's sort of like the healing this irreparable wound. Um, let me give you a couple of examples. Um, in last, the quarter before last, uh, in my graduate class at the University of Illinois in Chicago, I gave an, a, a Holocaust museum, perhaps predictably, okay? And two people came up as an ex two examples of, of what I'm trying to get at, perhaps which is even more clear than this work, even at the end. A, a guy did a scheme. You know, if you cut yourself, or if, if, if a doctor cuts the skin with a scalpel, the wound, you may know, separates. The skin pulls apart. In order to heal it, to suture it, you do something, if you can see it, that looks like that. A suture stitches something back together. There is, of course, a scar. This kid does, did a scheme for a Holocaust museum, which was just that, which was a ramp and going down to a museum. The building itself was the suture, but the scar was there. Okay? The scar, there was no desire not to express the scar, but there was the innate optimism to try to put it together. I thought it was fabulous. Another student, a young woman, did this fab, another underground museum. Based, it looked almost like, um, oh, a sort of Miesian, Dichtelian series of walls, parallel walls in section. Only some of the walls were failing, were cambered and they were restrained by tension cables and turnbuckles to keep them from falling. I, th I think not to express the problems of the day is a deceit that has no longer a great deal of use. Not to try to rewrite it, still leaving the trace or the reading of that problem is something I perceive as an innately human, optimistic thing. I mean, you know, maybe you don't, because I think you have to be 40 to know it, but I know I'm gonna die. I don't think Betsky knows it, but I know that Betsky's gonna die. <laughs> and, you know, but does that dissuade one from continuing to try? Answer, no. I think to try to put something together, to heal in a way, is also architectural. It's not just surgical. To try, there, is, there is that in us to try to do it right. So you say, am I trying to find a zeitgeist? I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to get it right. I'm trying to find, I'm trying to accommodate the condition of, of an architect who does try to get it right, and also a human being who understands that there are unresolvable problems that are actually unresolvable, that architecture can in no way correct, make right, etc. No matter how it dissimulates, it cannot solve those problems. I think the understanding of both those things, but the desire to optimistically try, is what is driving this work. Anne? build the constructive state rather than simply imply its possibility in mind, do you run the risk of a certain kind of dissimulation of pretending that one could actually build that? Because if you could, if you could build Absolutely. stage one, maybe you wouldn't have to get to stage two. Yeah, but you see, by building stage one, because stage one is the way, with exception, with the exception of him, the exception of him, the exception of, of some guys that are here, and Frank, and so forth. But mostly in the world, buildings are made like stage one. 
Most of the world is made like stage one. So it is, it's dissimulative in the sense that it, one is consciously building something in order to pull it apart in order to, to put it back together. Yes, there is no doubt. You, I, you run the risk maybe of, of reversing your, or turning it, turning it against yourself. Because if you can build that, the inevitability and the inescapability of phase two is open to question. Whereas if you take away part one, part one is there by implication. As soon as you understand the spatial relations in the hinged one, you see where it had to come from. But it can't be actually built. It can only be understood in that sense. Maybe. Maybe. I'm listening to you because I'm, this is at a, at, at a bumbling, and most of my life has been at a bumbling stage of trying to do the, it's a high risk operation to do this. In the example you just gave us of the, of the suture, that, that isn't true because you never see in the, in the example you just gave us the condition of unwoundedness. You only see the... the so my idea of, un, of unwoundedness, see, I, what I haven't mentioned is the, the, the concept of plastic surgery, which I consider to be Christian faith. That is, the dispensing with further interpretation. In other words, the covering up of the perpetual wound, which is basically what architecture is, is the covering up of the wound. Most architecture, I don't care if it's the classical language or it's modernist or whatever, it simply covers up the wound. It pretends that it doesn't exist. It is not there to be interpreted any longer, and there are obviously no problems. And it looks backwards for verification, just like the Renaissance, like Giamatti's book, uh, Exile and Change in Re Renaissance Literature, posits as well. Not that I ever thought the head of the National League would have such deep thoughts. Um, <laughs> and so most architecture is, in fact, has been done that way. What is fascinating is that we are finally at a time, what is really healthy about this time and the show at the modern and the problems with the show, etc., is that there is finally an expression that there is a problem and that architecture is attempting to begin to contend with those problems. That, however, is insufficient evidence for me to simply express the problem, the dislocative in the day. You know, because there is that other side of an architect. One may call it playing God. One may call it any number of things. But the attempt to heal it, knowing that you can't do it, you cannot do that. So yes, is one engaged perhaps in divisive, trick, little ways of trying to express that? Yeah, I accept that as a, that's a risk. But I think that in order to, to express a condition that roots itself in the essential optimism to try to rewrite it, but, and, but still expressing it, I think is crucial, absolutely. And infer and one. one, maybe to be, to be, you know, to in a sense expose the impossibility of the of the, the ordinary way. Do you see that? Right? Sure. Any other questions? Okay. Th oh, yes. In your book, the verse you make reference to Kabbalah. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, I think, I'm not sure what the relationship would, you know, it's like, it's again, going back to your question in the darkness. Um, what is there a Hebraic form? I mean, I, it's very difficult to find a correlation. And I would say that, as I said before, that there is none, actually. So thank you very much. <laughs>